Income tax 2023-2024. Special depreciation allowance. How much can you deduct? Get ready and some coffee because we need to know a lot of information to do income tax preparation 2023-2024. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our CPA six-pack shirts, a must-have for any pool or beach time. Mixing money with muscle, always sure to attract attention. Yeah, even if you're not a CPA, you need this shirt. So you can like pull in that iconic CPA six-pack stomach muscle vibe, man. You know, that CPA six-pack everyone envisions in their mind when they think CPA. Yeah, as a CPA, I actually and unusually don't have tremendous abs. However, I was blessed with a whole lot of belly hair. Yeah, allowing me to sculpt the hair into a nice CPA six-pack-like shape which is highly attractive. Yeah, may maybe the shirt will help you generate some belly hair too. And if it does, make sure to let me know. Maybe I'll try wearing it on my head. A and yes, I know six pack isn't spelled right, but three letters is more efficient than four. So I trimmed it down a bit, okay? It's an improvement. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Most of this information can be found in publication 946, How to Depreciate Property, Section 179, Deduction, Special Depreciation Allowance, Makers, Listed Property, and more, Tax Year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. Remember, in the first half of the income tax formula, basically a funny income statement. Most income statements having income minus expenses resulting in net income. Here, having income minus various deductions resulting in taxable income. The sole proprietorship, Schedule C, ultimately rolling into line one income of the formula. Noting the Schedule C itself, basically an income statement, having business income minus business expenses, which could also be called business deductions, resulting in, in essence, net business income, which rolls into line one income of the income tax formula, outlining the calculation on the 1040, this being the first page of the form 1040, Schedule C ultimately rolling into line eight, additional income from Schedule one. This is the Schedule one, additional income and adjustments to income. Part one, Schedule C rolling into line three, business income or loss. And this is a Schedule C, profit or loss from business having an income statement format income minus expenses were focused on the expenses which typically have the most different types of categories of items within it and some more complex than others one of the more complex ones being depreciation which even if we're on a cash based system as we saw in prior presentations is an area where the irs might force us to do an accrual thing putting the depreciable property on the books as an asset which is funny because we don't have really a balance sheet here. We only have an income statement, but we can have another depreciation schedule showing us the balance sheet account of depreciable property as well as the accumulated depreciation and calculating the current year depreciation expense with those schedules as well. Remembering with depreciation, we have the normal accrual concepts borrowed by the tax code from accounting principles of depreciating over a useful life, even with an accelerated method, which is basically the normal maker's depreciation, which we'll talk about later. That makes sense from a normal accrual standpoint. These upfront depreciations, such as a 179 deduction and special depreciation, do not make sense from a bookkeeping standpoint, but rather are things to stimulate the economy, lobbying politicians, doing whatever the politicians do, and so on and so forth. These upfront depreciations we're talking about now then can result basically in us saying, hey, we could have just expensed it on a cash-based system, equipment that is. 
but the code won't let us do that even if we're in a cash-based system. So we put it on the books as an asset. But then we're basically getting most of the expense, if not all of the expense, between the upfront depreciations, 179 and special depreciation. So why didn't you just allow me to expense it upfront instead of putting it on the books as an asset? And again, the answer to that is basically the tax code gets all messed up because they go back and forth from normal accounting principles that make sense to these other rules that have other rationale for them, which are these upfront uh, accelerated depreciations. All right, given that, we're looking at the special depreciation at this time. How much can you deduct? So figure the special depreciation allowance by multiplying the depreciable basis of the qualified reuse and recycled property, certain qualified property acquired after September 27, 2017, and certain plant bearing fruits and nuts by the applicable percentage. So we talked about the percentages in the prior presentation. Much of the depreciable property for small businesses might be depreciable up to basically 80% at this point in time. That's going to be the major example that we're going to be using. Note that that's less than, of course, some of the top limits for the 179 deduction that we talked about in prior presentations. And therefore, small many small businesses might use the 179 depreciation to deduct the whole thing. And then in those instances where you have different depreciation allowances between special and the 179, you might have some complications and some combinations between those two depreciations. And when the 179 hits the cap, which was quite a significantly high cap for many small businesses, but not too high for many large and mid-sized businesses, then you have questions about what's the best optimization of the categorization of the depreciation between the two kind of accelerated methods, 179 and special. So for qualified property other than listed property, enter the special depreciation allowance on form 4562 part two. So we saw this when we looked at the 179 deduction. We'll take a look at that form more in detail when we get to the practice problem. For qualified property that is listed property, enter the special depreciation allowance on form 4562 part five line 25. You will recall that some properties such as automobiles, for example, might have certain limitations with regards to upfront uh, depreciation as well over and above other types of property. Tip, if you place qualified property in service in a short tax year, you can take the full amount of special depreciation allowance. In other words, if you think about normal depreciation concepts, when I buy the property, I usually don't buy it on January 1st of the tax year. I buy it basically in the middle of the tax year somewhere. So then the question is, do I have to prorate the amount of depreciation in the current year? And how would I do that? Do I do that by the day that I bought it? Or do I do it by the week that I bought it, the month that I bought it? Or like a mid-year convention, meaning I would get to take like half the depreciation in the current year and usually with these accelerated depreciations they're trying to make it like a simple thing where you get most of the depreciation when you buy it and that would make sense that when you buy it they're not going to make you prorate you know the depreciation and take half of it in the current year or something if you bought it in the current year then you might be able to deduct it in the current year bought it and placed it in service for example depreciable basis this is the property's cost or other basis multiplied by the percentage of basis investment use reduced by the total amount of any credits and deductions alloc allocable to the property. So basis, usually you can kind of interchange that with cost for most property. If we buy the property, then whatever we bought it for is going to be in essence the basis. And then the basis, you can think of the adjusted basis as something that adjusts over time. It's going to adjust primarily due to decreasing the basis with the depreciation or by the depreciation that we consumed. Now, remember that the basis is something that for taxes is kind of good, meaning basis represents a deduction that we're going to get at some point. We would rather take that deduction sooner rather than later. Right. So if I if I put the 10,000 piece of equipment on the books because I bought it for 10,000, I would like to expense it now if I could, which would adjust the basis down to zero. But I would do that if I can get the expense today rather than tomorrow, typically, because that would be good for taxes. However, 
uh, if, if I can't get the basis now, then I'm going to depreciate it over the useful life. As I depreciate it, the adjusted basis will basically go down. If I sell the property and it hasn't been fully depreciated, I would, I would rather have a higher basis at that time because when I sell it, it's going to be the sales price minus the cost or adjusted basis in this case. And the higher the adjusted basis, the lower the amount of gain that I'm going to have. So I'm basically recognizing or getting the tax benefit of the basis that I did not consume at the point of sale. So we often have this interchange between the basis and when and and the deduction, right? When do I get the and that's going to give a, a play in terms of a timing difference as to when we're going to get the tax benefit related to the cost of the equipment. Uh, so the following are examples of some credits and deductions that reduce depreciable basis. So any section 179 deduction. So we saw the 179 is the other depreciation that is strange, not normal to accounting methods, another upfront depreciation, which oftentimes we might take first in this case, because we might be able to take 100% of the property in 179 and then have the special depreciation, which might be limited to like 80%. So I might try first to take the 179 deduction and then if I hit the cap and I can no longer take any more 179 deduction, like let's say I had a piece of property that was $100,000, but I only have like 90,000 left of the total 179 deduction I can take against it because I applied the rest of it to other property, that would mean I'm gonna take the 100,000 minus the 90,000, which would leave me 10,000 which may then be subject or applicable, or I might be able to apply the, uh, the special depreciation where I might be able to get another, let's say 80% of an upfront depreciation. And then the 20% of that remaining amount would be subject possibly to makers, the normal kind of double declining method. All right, so any deduction for removal of barriers to the, to the disabled and the elderly. So any uh, disabled access credit enhanced oil recovery credit and credit for employer provided child care facilities and services basis adjustments to in, uh, investment prop, uh, credit property under section 50C of the Internal Revenue Code. These are things where basically you're, you're kind of getting a benefit for it already. So you're kind of eating into the, to the basis in essence of it by getting these other benefits for them that's not as common most likely than say the 179 deduction and the interplay between it and uh, the special depreciation and then the makers. So section 181 ex, uh, expense deduction, depreciating the remaining cost after you figure your special depreciation allowance for your qualified property, you can use the remaining cost to figure your makers your regular maker's depreciation deduction discussed in chapter four. So if we put the property on the books, let's say it was a 100,000 piece of property, we might be able to take the 179 deduction for it, but let's say that we've already capped that out or I don't wanna take the 179 deduction for whatever reason. Then I might be able to apply the special depreciation. Let's say it was qualified 80% special depreciation. Then 80% of it, would be taken up front possibly 80,000 as an expense leaving 20,000 that hasn't been expensed that 20,000 represents basically the adjusted basis going forward which we still get a benefit from possibly through normal depreciation the maker's depreciation which is the one that's actually normal in terms of accounting principles basically a double declining half year convention which we'll talk about later therefore you must reduce the depreciable basis of the property by the special depreciation allowance before figuring your regular maker's depreciation deduction. So obviously, if you get 80,000 depreciation up front of a 100,000 piece of property, you cannot then deduct another 100,000 on makers. No, you can only deduct the remaining basis that you haven't already got a benefit from, the 20,000 using makers over the useful life of the property. Example, 
on July 1st, 2023, you placed in service in your business qualified property that is not long production period property or certain aircraft that cost $450,000 and that you acquired after September 27, 2017. You did not elect to claim the Section 179 deduction. So you deduct 80% of the cost, that's going to be $360,000 as a special depreciation allowance for 2023. You use the remaining cost of the property to figure the regular maker's depreciation deduction uh, for your property for 2023 and later years. All right, like kind exchanges and involuntary conversions. Now these are going to be usually more unusual type of situation, like kind exchanges could happen say in real estate for example in which case again we have this funny kind of interplay between the basis allocation that's going to be kind of carried carried over in an exchange situation which becomes quite complex from just like a bookkeeping and logistical calculation in something like real estate because it's not usually a one-for-one -one exchange there's usually some kind of cash that is going to be involved so the basis calculations become somewhat complex. So this is kind of a special area uh, in and of itself, but we'll touch on it here. So if you uh, acquired qualified property in a like-kind exchange or involuntary conversion, like the government forced you to convert the property or something, after September 27, 2017, and the qualified property is new property, uh, the carryover basis and any excess basis of the acquired property is eligible for the special depreciation allowance. If you acquired qualified property in a like-kind exchange or involuntary conversion after September 27, 2017, and the qualified property is used property, only the excess basis of the acquired property is eligible for the special depreciation allowance after you figure your special depreciation allowance you can use the remaining carryover basis to figure your regular maker's depreciation deduction see figuring the deduction for property acquired in non-taxable exchange in chapter four under uh, how is the depreciation deduction figured 